Today, we are going to talk about things that I used daily, actually daily at Amazon that I never heard about the entire time I was in college. I got into this position where I was actually working with production services, and it felt like opening up a door into a brand new world. No college can teach everything. I'm not knocking my college. I'm just saying these are things that you might want to know about, because if you can demonstrate a knowledge of those things to a recruiter somewhere on your resume, you might have a leg up. Logs and metrics. Now, I'm sure that you've heard the term logs and metrics, and I'm sure that you have like a general understanding of what those things are and why they're important. But I really want to dive deep into the way that this comes up so often in college. You build sort of simple programs. You build sort of simple things that, you know, they have a step one and they have a step two and they have a step three. And all of these things, first of all, are probably living in the same program, right? These are probably your same little executable file. And not only that, not only are these probably your same little executable file, but these steps are just performed sequentially. And don't get me wrong, there's value in that. But the real world does not always work in such a simple way, and it can be difficult to reason about where things are going wrong in your system. Let's take a look at an example where you might care. Instead, let's say that we have step one, step two, and step three. And these things are all independent services, okay? And I know that this might seem absurd, but I promise you there are plenty of places where every individual step is going to be its own thing. I built it often at Amazon. So these are their own individual services, right? We've got box one, box two, box three. And now let's make things even more complicated. And we're going to say that these two things can run at the same time, but they must complete before you can start running step three. If step three never runs and you need to know why it never ran on real historical production data, right? You need to know why for this customer, step three never ran which is most often the question being asked. It's not like you can go and just spin up the program locally and reproduce the issue necessarily because you don't even know what the issue is. You don't know what causes step three not to run. You have no idea yet. You just have your preconceived notions about the code, but you don't know what state the code was in to cause step three to never run. And this is why it is super important and talked about often to have these two ideas of logs and metrics. You will have logs inside of step one that will say things like, you know, finished X, right? Uh, processing Y. And it will include information. Most importantly, it will include some type of ID, and that ID will be the same between here and here and here, so that we can get an understanding and trace the story of a single request. And that always is about historical data of something that actually happened, and as a result, this boils down to logs and metrics. You have to rely on having had foresight. And that foresight is legitimately to, in your code, slap in place the functional equivalent of print here, okay? This is basically all it is. It's going to go somewhere and it's going to be searchable, but you're basically just saying, here we are and here's our ID. No one cares about this at all, but it's like a real thing. Get hygiene, okay? I wanted to find... I'm hoping that I can find, I forgot to look before stream, an example of my old commits. Oops, images, minimum width on search button, fixed JSON, 
Fix JSON errors. Fix JSONs. Edited ranking algorithm. That one's pr probably fine. This is how you write commits when you're the only person on the project and or like it's a small group of people, whatever, not like a professional environment. And also a lot of these things should never have made their way onto main. Notice how there's three back-to-back -back fixed JSONs commits. I'm going to guess that this one didn't fix it. I'm going to guess that this one didn't fix it. Oh, sorry. Four, we've got probably fixed <laughs> and we've got oops that maybe is related i don't know what the oops is now i already have a video where i talk about how the software development life cycle works so i'm gonna like link that in you know i'm gonna try to remember at least you have to genuinely have like descriptive commit slash pr descriptions because these things get used often i often still at like at every job i've ever been on Check the git blame and see why a line of code is the way that it is. Not in a, who did this type of way, okay? Like, usually there is genuinely important context that helps you understand what is happening. Infrastructure as code, all right? First of all, infrastructure barely gets talked about. That varies, and some programs might be better at that than my school was. I don't remember ever having to use a cloud provider like AWS or anything like this during a college class. And I don't remember them talking to us about like, yeah, you're going to have to like spin up a server and that server is going to need a network connection to a database and so forth and so on. Everything we did was sort of like local. So we wrote servers and we wrote databases, but they like talked to each other just on our local machine and whatever. And so we didn't really think about this idea of infrastructure and how these things really genuinely tie together. All of this is stuff that is very, very uh, like annoying as it gets more complicated and it will get more complicated. And not only that, it also is the type of thing that needs to happen almost oh, like in a big enough company needs to happen multiple times. Okay. Because you've got U.S. and almost certainly, almost certainly most places, like big, sizable companies, you're also going to have EU, okay? So because of the fact that we need to do this multiple times and those things need to re remain in parity, you don't want to just go into the AWS UI and click around and do stuff. I would be willing to bet that many of you, if you have spun up infrastructure for projects, were just clicking around the AWS CLI, or UI or doing it through the CLI because that's how I started doing it. Infrastructure as code is about codifying down these this idea of these connections. You make some sort of basically template that is, you know, written as text files that represents this, right? So a lot of the time, let's pretend that you're doing it in like cloud formation or something like that, which is the AWS one. Uh, you'll end up with something that's like a YAML file. And I forget what things look like, but let's pretend that you have something that's like DynamoDB and you'll give it like a name and let's call it like service one table. Then let's say you've got your server, like service one, and this is like an EC2 instance. And you'll give it a name, service one. And you'll say, basically, you'll have to give it permission to write to that DynamoDB table. And this is not what it looks like. I always just copy and paste stuff, okay? It doesn't look like this, but it's gonna be something along these lines. Last bit here. Um, and this one's like pretty minor, I'm going to be honest, but it is something that you'll see that I found wildly, wildly unintuitive at first. Okay. So this will probably be short, but mono repos. Okay. Like it's the new hotness and it's not new, but it's like hotness. You'll see this a lot of places and it's very odd and it definitely was not a structure I was prepared for. Okay. Okay. Where the idea behind a monorepo is you have 
some sort of like single repo that will have like, you know, services and it will have, let's say like workers, right? Maybe like background workers or something like that. And then it will have like libraries. This is going to be a bunch of totally unrelated stuff, just all in the same programming language, basically. That's going to be like service one and service one is owned by team A. And then you have service two, which is owned by team B. And then you have service three, which is owned by team C. Okay. This is the bit that made it so unintuitive to me is there were like decisions that your team does not have the power to make. The goal is that broader than just your team should all be in alignment about how things work. Why would you do this? The real benefit is code reusability. If I want to write a library that I think T service one and service two can both use then I can just slap it in here and service two can use it for free without having to do anything weird. It becomes easier to do CI CD because again, you're only working with run repo. All of those services have like a well-defined structure to them. And three, I think the biggest thing is just like the processes can be standardized of things like uh, what code or we'll say like what pull request templates look like and all of that stuff, like all of that extra kind of boring stuff. I don't really have like a point to this one, but it's just people, people are doing shit and it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird. You're going to run into this and you're going to be like, why, why is this happening? So this is why, and hopefully at least now you're aware that you might run into something like this and you might run into some logistical challenges as a result. Hopefully these are things that, you know, you can, you can go and dive into and get a little bit of an understanding on and, uh, and they'll help you. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it. Catch you on the next one.